I wanted to tell a little bit of a story. Uh, some years ago, we, uh, the camp directors were trained in wilderness first aid because of the, uh, typically we oftentimes would take uh, young people out into, on hikes and that kind, kind of thing, and we felt that it would be helpful if we knew wilderness first aid rather than just regular first aid, uh, which many of us have been, have been trained in over the years. And it really did come in handy because oftentimes when you're out in the wilderness, you can be uh, several hours from any kind of help. And so to know how to deal with things like broken, a broken leg, a, a bad sprain, to know how to, to put together a splint, even if it's with uh, things that you, you have to kind of gather together to make it work. We did role plays where we would gather together sticks and branches and what and do what we needed to do uh, using the items we had available in order to help someone who had gone through a typical injury that you might find in the wilderness. And it was during that time that I learned about something called soap notes. Now, if you are in the medical profession, uh, you've probably heard of soap notes. I, I will not in any way claim to be an expert in soap notes, but uh, we did learn about them. And SOAP is an acronym, and it's, it's really it's a method of documentation employed by healthcare providers to write down notes about a, on a patient's chart. And it was initially developed by physicians to allow them to approach complex patients with multiple problems in a highly organized way. Uh, today, it's widely adapted as a communication tool between interdisciplinary healthcare providers and a way to document a patient's progress. Um, pre in pre-hospital care, which was what we were doing in the wilderness, uh, providers such as emergency medical technicians can use the same format, this SOAP note, to communicate patient information to emergency department clinicians. So we would, in essence, we would use this little piece of paper that we had in our, in our first aid, and we would go through certain things like S stands for subjective. What are they telling us is the problem? Oh, my back hurts really bad. Well, we write that down. A patient says back hurts. Uh, objective is what the O stands for. Objective is what we, we do. We get in there and we assess the We look at the situation ourselves and what do we see is the problem. Perhaps, and then A stands for uh, assessment. You get in there, feel around, see if there's any tender spots on the arm or the, or the neck or whatever, and be able to write down what we find. And then finally P, S-O-A-P, P was the plan, what we, we intend to do for the next hour or two until we can get them to a medical professional. And then once this happens, we were told to turn over that documentation, that soap note, to the person, if it's a, if it's a ambulance or whatever, we would turn it over to the person taking the person in. And sometimes in the wilderness, of course, it might be a helicopter, it might be a float plane that flies in. You literally hand the person off to the, to the wilderness, oftentimes wilderness first responders, and they would take that note and they would have a better idea of what happened, what the initial complaints were, what was done to assess the patient, and um, what the plan was, what's been happening until they got there. So it's a way of documenting in a way that gives you, and really uh, having that plan, having that written down, what I need to do next, really does help you because uh, as an untrained uh, you know, I'm not trained in medical profession. If somebody gets hurt really bad, it, it's hard to control what the brain's thinking. You know, what I do next, what I do. And having this soap note helps you walk through exactly what needs to be done. Even in a traumatic situation, you can kind of keep your head about you and know what needs to be done in order to help that person. And so it was this idea of a soap note that we had in our, in our uh, first aid kits that gave us guidance about what to do and how to pass that information on to someone else. And again, this was written out. We actually would take the time, if, if we possibly could, and write down and record what was going on. Several years ago, I ran into another kind of soap note that was kind of interesting to me. It was a Bible study method called the SOAP Bible study method, S-O-A-P. Now, there are many different methods of studying the Bible, and you probably have had over the years several methods that you've uh, tried. Uh, uh, 
There are various methods. There are various types of Bible study. We could go into character studies where you study the life of David or the life of Solomon, and you learn what you can, everything you can from that particular person. There are word studies where you would go in depth about what a particular word means and how it's used in various places in the Bible. And there's also just the idea of reading the Bible and not really doing anything else except reading it. And that is a type of Bible study, a reading through the Bible. It's a very important part of it. But sometimes we can tend to get less interested in the Bible, especially if we get bored with our particular form of study or what we've been doing. Sometimes it's just hard to take the time We find ourselves frustrated because we haven't taken the time to do Bible study. We know it's a core part of our spiritual life, but it sometimes just doesn't get done. And we feel bad about it, and we know that we need to do it. And I have found over the years that sometimes uh, it helps to change up what we're doing. If we've not done character studies, for example, to to try that and to see how that works and what we can do. If we've never done word studies, to try that. If we've never read the Bible all the way through, to go, go that direction. Today I'd like to talk about this idea, focus in on the idea of the SOAP Bible study method. Not because it's the only or necessarily the best, but I do think it presents us with some helpful information in terms of our Bible study, whether we actually write out soap notes or not, it can help us in our everyday Bible study. If you would, let's go back to Psalm chapter 119. Psalm 119. Just to get started here with some uh, a very familiar scripture here in Psalm 119 in terms of the importance of God's Word in our lives. We just heard about wisdom, and of course, We're learning about wisdom from the Word of God. It's so important in our lives. It says in Psalm 119 and verse 105 that your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We look at that. We will oftentimes read this even uh, in our youth camp programs, that God's Word is very important to guide us in terms of which direction to go. It helps, give us, helps gives, give us the wisdom that we need to make good decisions. God's Word is a light unto our path, and it's so very important. The longer we're in God's church, the more years we live and the more we study God's Word, it can be, well, I don't think we all ever get to the point where we think we know everything about God's Word, but we can get to the point sometimes where we, we've studied the doctrines, and we feel confident that, that the doctrines of the church and, and of the truth is correct. We can feel confident that we could talk about what we believe, for example, about the Sabbath. And we know it's true. You know, some of us, I'm sure, can go to that additional level where we feel confident sitting down with someone who is curious about the Sabbath, who doesn't know anything about it, but they're curious about it, and we feel confident that we can explain to them from the Scripture what the Bible has to say about the Sabbath and the importance of the Sabbath and why it continues to be relevant. That is a, what we would consider a doctrinal study, and God's Word has lit the way for us in terms of our belief, in terms of what we believe to be true about Scripture. If you go back to Matthew chapter 22... Kind of a startling scripture here. Christ, I'm sure, didn't make any friends among the Sadducees when he made this very poignant comment to them. The Sadducees, of course, were experts in God's Word. They studied God's Word. They knew God's Word. The priestly line were typically Sadducees in, in Christ's day. And they're asking him about the resurrection. And they're trying to, it seems, trap him in terms of how can there be a resurrection? You know, what if this person is married, this person, that person, this person, their husband's died all these times? You know, and they try to trap him in terms of in the resurrection, if there is a resurrection, how would this problem be resolved? And, uh, of course, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, and that's why they're sad, you see. That's the only way I can remember that. (laughs) But Matthew chapter 22, 
And verse 29 says, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken. You're wrong. Not knowing the scriptures. Ooh. Now that had to hit them hard. He says, nor the power of God. I mean, okay, we may not know the power of God, understand God's power completely, but we know the scriptures. This is like telling a college professor in literature that he doesn't know anything about literature. I mean, uh, it had to hit them hard. And who's this to be saying that? This isn't someone who studied the Scripture the way that they would expect someone who knows Scripture would study Scripture. He hit them hard. You don't know. You're mistaken. You don't know the Scriptures. And he goes on to prove the resurrection in a very interesting way. We won't get into that. But he did know the Scriptures. And he's making the point to them that even though they have so much scriptural knowledge, they're missing an important key. And they were. And... The same thing can be true as, people, as we go through this life, and we know we, each of us probably came, came into the church with the idea that we had misunderstandings. And if you grew up in the church, you also recognize that the, the world has certain misunderstandings about Scripture. And they may understand certain things, but they're missing certain key points. And so in this way, uh, Jesus was able to say, you don't know the Scriptures. Let's go back to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. This is an example of Apollos and his story. Apollos was, traveled to Ephesus. And it talks about how, how he boldly preached. Acts chapter 18. And we'll pick up in verse 24. Acts 18 verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the Scriptures. Notice this verse is very mighty in the Scriptures. He knew the Scripture. He came to Ephesus. The man, uh, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Uh, he was fervent in the Spirit, and he taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Notice here's this Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, you know, they were faithful church members. And they were able to take this person mighty in the scriptures aside and explain a few things that he was missing. You know, he didn't recognize about the, truly who the Messiah was and all those details. He preached the, the, he preached the baptism of John. Repentance. But he had some areas that he needed to understand more. And here these Aquila and Priscilla were able to, by the fact that they had studied the Scripture and they knew the Scripture, to help this very person mighty in the Scriptures to understand a little more. Could we do that? Could we take someone who knows a lot about the Bible and give them that little extra knowledge that would help them to understand more? And what is it? I ask myself, and we can ask ourselves, what is it that I or you, even though we have understanding about the Scripture, what is it that we may be missing? Some little element here or there that might give us greater uh, encouragement, that might help us to be able to understand something more deeply, or even live our life a little different way. That is why Bible study can be so very important. There's always something there for us. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Again, a very important scripture when it comes to the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says that for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word is living and powerful. And so we never can learn all there is to know about the word of God. We always learn more. <clears throat> so let's go through this idea of a method of Bible study that, we call, that I call here soap note. Actually, it's a method that's been around for some years. And it's a method which allows us to soak up what the Bible is saying, not only what it's saying, 
but how we can apply it in our lives. We can actually put it to use in our lives. You see, just having knowledge isn't enough. Pharisees and Sadducees had a lot of biblical knowledge. But they were missing important things in terms of the way they lived. And for us, knowledge is important, but how can we apply it in our lives and have it change our lives? That's what I like about this particular Bible study method, is it, is it focuses on what the Bible is saying and also how we can apply it. So the first, in this acronym called SOAP, the first thing is S, which stands for Scripture. And the idea here is to pick a scripture or a short passage that's very important to you. Pick a, pick a passage that's very important to you. I was listening to a sermon by Mr. Levy this week he gave not long ago in the Dallas congregation, I believe, about a Bible study. He made the point about, go where we're curious. Are you curious about a certain scripture? Did you hear something read, perhaps, in a sermon that you're curious to learn more about? Sometimes it's good to keep a list of those so we can go back to them. And this method of Bible study is a good way of, of pursuing and studying that. Find that scripture. Perhaps if we go back to Proverbs chapter 3, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. This is an important scripture with regard to God's word versus our opinion about things. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. So, for example, you could choose this particular verse and, and write it down. This is the one I want to focus on. How can I learn more about this particular verse? And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. We'll talk more about uh, going into the specifics on Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. But what is oftentimes encouraged to do is to write out the scripture in your notebook. In fact, this method is out there. It's been out there for years. You can actually buy little soap journals that has the acronym SOAP uh, on the pages so that you can just fill in uh, what you want. I, I personally don't think they allow enough space, so I, I like to just do it free form. Uh, and, and, and I've gotten to the point where this is, uh, I, I, and you can get to the point where you think about scriptures this way. You don't even have to always put soap down. You just, this is the way you begin to think about examining a scripture. But they do recommend that you just write it out in a notebook, that you uh, jot down your thoughts. So S stands for scripture. What scriptural passage are you going to choose? Which one are you curious about? Do you want to learn more about? The second point, O, S-O, O stands for observation. And this is where you would really spend a, a good deal of time. Uh, what observations can you make about this passage? For example, you might write down, you may look into the background of the passage. What is the background? Why was it written? To whom, to whom was it written? What was the occasion? What's the overall theme of the, of the book or the passage? Um, another thing you might consider is the context, the immediate context. What's being talked about? Because your goal as you observe, as you use observation, is to find out what is it that God wants us to learn from this scripture. And so you want to put it in its proper context. What is the correct way to interpret the scripture? Because some people interpret it wrongly. Uh, you may read commentaries that have completely opposite interpretations of a scripture. Well, what is the correct interpretation. That's something you would use observation and study to determine. Um, if there's any questions that come up as you study this, as you study this, write them down. Sometimes it's good to go back to those questions and answer them. As you are in this step, it's a good time to use different translations. What do different translations say? What words are translated differently? Sometimes you can get a very quick idea of other ways that the, the verse can be understood. Again, you have to be careful, especially when it comes to doctrinal topics. If, they're being, if they have a particular background on a doctrine that's not accurate, they may put that, a translator might include that, and we have to be wary of that and cognizant that that can happen. Another thing we can do th during this observation stage is, is what words or phrases stand out? What are some important words or phrases in this verse? 
And we can identify them, then look them up. I actually use some Bible helps. You can use various Bible helps online. One is BibleStudyTools.com. I've used BibleStudyTools.com. I've used BibleGateway.com. Uh, many of them are free. Some of them you can pay a couple dollars a month or, or very little and get access to a lot of Bible helps. And some of them will give you the meanings of the words that you're looking at. And that can help you come to a deeper understanding of the Scripture itself. Again, during this observation, observing everything you can about the Scripture, uh, its context, its background, particular words. Another thing you can do is consider other Scriptures on the same topic and write them down too. What other Scriptures may apply do I need to consider? Remember Isaiah 28 verse 10 says that precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And so we do find tr uh, truth in various places in the Bible, and we, put it, we can put it all together. So other scriptures uh, that pertain to that topic can be very helpful. And consider writing it down, actually like you would, like we would in a medical soap note, to write it down in a notebook so that you can go back and refer to it, you can add to it later. Oftentimes it's easy to forget something you learned early on because you get sidetracked onto something else. So writing it down can be very helpful. <clears throat> so consider writing down anything, everything that you learn about the passage. That's the O in SOAP. The next point is A, S-O-A. A is the application, and this becomes so very important. Sometimes people never get to this point. They learn all this stuff about a scripture, but they never actually get to the application phase of it. How might this scripture apply in our lives? We can ask a number of questions. And one thing I like to do is, is ask how the scripture might, applied, might have applied to the initial readers of the, of the book. If it's a book that Paul wrote to Corinthians, how might the Corinthians have read it or understood it? How might they have applied it in their lives? To me, that gives a little, a little greater insight in terms of how we might apply it even today. We can, during this application uh, phase, we can ask certain probing questions, like, are there any current situations in my life that this might apply to? Any current situations. Oftentimes, Proverbs can be approached in this way. We can just read through the book of Proverbs with a particular problem in our life that we're going through at the time, and we will glean information that gives us wisdom in terms of what we might do under the circumstances we're in. But are there any current situations in my life that this might apply? Um, how can I incorporate this lesson or these lessons in my everyday life? Another thing we might ask is, why is it so difficult to, to do this? You know, maybe we learn the lesson, but why is it so difficult to apply this? How is my human nature fighting against me making this part of my life? To come face to face with the problems that we might have in implementing the lesson that we're learning, and to acknowledge them. This is part of the application uh, phase. What are the consequences if we don't apply this lesson? What negative aspects might, might happen in our life if we don't apply what we've learned in this scripture? Uh, there are any number of questions you might ask yourself as you think about how you can apply this, but the basic idea is, what do I need to do to apply this lesson that I've learned in my life. Now, if it's a doctrinal thing, perhaps it's just a matter of understanding things differently. Uh, but oftentimes we have so many scriptures that have to do with our Christian living. And we can literally ask ourselves, what can I do differently now that I know this lesson? So the application phase is so very important uh, in our Bible study and so often neglected for just knowledge itself. So that's S-O-A, and P, P is prayer. Now, P is last just because in soap, P is last, but uh, I think that we all know that we should approach prayer, we should approach Bible study in a very prayerful way. Uh, it's God's Word, and so to pray about what we've learned is very important. We can actually ask God to help us understand what we've studied more deeply. Ask God to help us Learn how we can apply it. Ask God to help us see how we can apply it. Maybe we don't understand initially how this might apply in some area of our life. But 
God can help us to see that. Remember, it's God's word that we're reading, and we need his help to understand it and to apply it in our lives. So that's the idea of soap, picking a scripture, objectively looking at it, and then applying it, um, prayerfully asking God to help us to learn from it. There are some people who advocate a soaps method, and they'll add another S. And that S, I think, can be interesting. S, if you use the soaps method, is sharing. The idea being to be willing to talk about with others what you've learned. I know oftentimes we'll do that at services. We'll talk about something we've been studying, maybe something we've learned. We'll ask a question, have you ever studied this? You know, what did you get out of it? What did you learn from it? But to be willing to talk about it. I'm not talking about preaching or lecturing to each other about uh, what we've learned that week. Uh, that might turn people off. We just want to uh, lecture them. But to be able to make it part of our, incorporated in our conversation. We should never avoid spiritual conversation in our fellowship. And so this idea of soaps and adding the S in an appropriate, an appropriate way can be very helpful, I do think. So let's go back to Proverbs chapter 3, where we turned to earlier. And let's apply this method just as an example. We'll use several scriptures here that deal with God's Word and the importance of God's Word. Our scripture will be Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lead not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Well, we might, once we pick our scripture in the observation stage, we might ask the question, what does it mean to trust? What is this Greek word really getting at? Is it deeper than our English word to trust? We could use certain uh, Bible helps to help us understand. And sometimes different translations can help us by translating the word a word differently. What does it mean to acknowledge God? When I think of the word acknowledge, it's like tipping my hat. And, you know, hey. <laughs> Back in, Gail used to tease me in Georgia when we'd drive by on little country roads. We'd drive by somebody, we'd raise our finger to say hello to them as we were driving by. She was from the city. You didn't raise your finger. Well, people raise their fingers, but not for that reason. Uh, and we were just saying hi. Uh, and uh, she said, well, that's really strange uh, that people would do that. To me, I think of acknowledging as kind of a short little thing. Well, what does the word acknowledge mean? You take, get to looking into it more, you find it means rely on. To really put our trust in, to rely on God. And so that can be an insight that you can learn by asking the question, what does acknowledge really mean? You might consider other scriptures that can inform you. Similar scriptures, Proverbs 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. As Mr. Servidio pointed out, Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now you got knowledge, excuse me, Proverbs 1 is, is the beginning of knowledge, and Proverbs 11 is the beginning of wisdom. So we learn from God's Word, and we learn to develop wisdom. So that's, we could talk about those things in the observation stage. The application stage, we might ask, how do, I tend, uh, how do I tend to lean to my own understanding? What do I tend to do in my life where I'm leaning to my own understanding rather than God's? How can I change that? Do I acknowledge God in all my ways? What would that look like in my life if I were to truly acknowledge God in all my ways? How, how would that look? What would I be doing day to day to make that happen? Use the application phase. The prayerful stage, we could ask God to help us to see where we, lean to, where we tend to lean to our own understanding, where we sometimes don't acknowledge Him. Ask God for help in, in applying this in our life. And also claiming the promise that God made here. He said, He shall direct your paths can claim that promise in prayer to God. So what was really a quick read, you know, you can read that verse very quickly, can turn into an easy half-hour Bible study as you, you utilize various helps. You come to a better understanding of the verse. <clears throat> I've got some commentary in my notes here that uh, I just naturally 
copied in because it was interesting to me. I won't go into all that because I'll leave that for your study. But it, it, even reading certain commentaries on this gives some helpful insights into how, how we might understand it and apply it in our lives. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 4. We read this again earlier as well. But if we were to apply this SOAP method, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, what might it look like? It says in Hebrews 4.12 that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the, heart, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We could ask the question, uh, how is the word of God living? I mean, this Bible doesn't have a heart, it doesn't have blood vessels, you know, it's not breathing. In what way is the word of God living? You know, I oftentimes think of that in terms of it doesn't matter where you are in life, you'll find something in the Word of God that can help you. Uh, sometimes we learn things, of course, we never thought of before. It's like, it's like we're being talked to by, by a person, by God. And even though it's the same words that always, always have been there, they strike us in a different way, almost as if someone is speaking to us. How is, how is God's Word living? How is it powerful? Do a study. of What does that word mean? How, how, how is it powerful? Why is it, important? Why, why is it important for God's word to pierce? What does that word mean? It's like he's piercing down into our very physical being. And we know that God's word doesn't literally pierce down to our bones and marrow. But what does that mean? We could give some thought to that. What does it mean to discern the, the thoughts and intents? There could be a lot there to think about in terms of to discern the heart, the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wow, that's pretty deep. In the observation phase, we might ask these questions. The application phase, we might ask, uh, how can I let God's word truly pierce me that deep? Deep in my inner being to where it moves me. What can I do to allow that to happen? How can I learn about um, my thoughts and intents in the way that God sees my thoughts and intents? How can God's Word help me to understand that all the more? I think in this particular case, if we read the context of Hebrews 3 and 4, it helps us understand and answer that question even a little better. Israel had gone off track in the wilderness, and we're being encouraged not to do that. And to remain diligent. He talks about that in the context of this, of this scripture. <clears throat> and finally, prayer. We can ask God to help us because God's word pierces us, helps us to see the thoughts and intents of the heart. We can ask God to help God's word to change us. Pray that prayer. Just one scripture can contain so very much to give us uh, understanding, greater understanding, greater appreciation for God's Word. And if we use a, an organized method for studying it, it can help us, we can understand more deeply what is contained in the Scripture. Finally, let's go back to 2 Timothy, chapter, 2 Timothy 3. Another very familiar verse, but it contains so very much here. Especially if we look at it in terms of the SOAP study method. Again, I don't I, don't want, I want to make sure everyone understands this is an example of a method. It's helpful because it includes the uh, application phase, but there are many different methods. Uh, hopefully we can find some that we can truly benefit and learn from and improve our Bible study. But if we use the SOAP method in 2 Timothy 3, verse 13, we'll pick up in context here, verse 13 through 17. This is written to Paul, I mean written to Timothy by Paul, um, Timothy was a younger uh, minister. It says in verse 13, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you uh, wise for salvation through faith that is in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. So notice for Timothy, he's known the Scriptures from childhood. I think that's encouraging for even our young people here today. You can understand the scriptures. Uh, 
Uh, you're not going to become a scholar in a year. None of us are. But you can begin to understand scriptures from childhood, just like Timothy did. And that, that understanding is able to make us wise for salvation. We can have the wisdom that leads to salvation because of our study and understanding of the scriptures. Notice verse 16. This is the passage, verse 16 and 17, that we can name as, quote, our scripture to study. Where it says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, you've read this many times before, and I'm sure many of you have studied it as well. But notice, we first of all learn something that we can find very quickly. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. We have heard that this means God breathed, that God breathed the Scripture. It comes directly from God in the original as it was inspired. And this does not include mistranslations or, or scribal errors. But in the original, as it was given, it was God breathed. It came directly from God. And so it tells us that this isn't just, these weren't just men who were making up what they thought may be God's ideas. It's God breathed. You can, uh, so we can, have, we can observe this scripture. Notice it goes on to say, in, uh, it's profitable for doctrine. Now, oftentimes we will study doctrine, whether it's the Sabbath or holy days or, or various things. And doctrine is a very important part of our study. And we should be able to explain doctrine. One of the things that I, I think makes a big difference is, is different. It's a very different thing to understand something and to be able to explain it. To be able to explain it is a whole different level. I might have mentioned it before, but when I was in, in high school, I took an advanced placement biology class. I loved it, and, uh, but it was hard. And so one of the things I would do is, is I set up a chalkboard in my room and I would pretend to be teaching it. And by doing that, I was able to incorporate that knowledge so much more in my life. I was able to do very well on the tests. I've never done that with any other subject in school. But just the exercise of teaching it helped me understand it so much more. And sometimes we can approach doctrine from that standpoint. You know, if I, I, I understand it, but if I had to explain it, what would I say? Makes a good exercise in and of itself. But notice... The Word of God is profitable for doctrine, but also for reproof and correction. Aren't they the same thing? I mean, did God just inspire, God breathed here, two, two words that really mean the same thing? Well, there's an interesting element to study. What, what is the difference in the original Greek from reproof and correction? I tend to see them as the same thing. But in reality, there, there's a difference. Some translations say rebuke for reproof. And in, in essence, it's getting down to the idea of uh, Scripture can tell us when we're wrong. To rebuke or reprove someone is to point out the error of their ways. So I, Scripture can show me where I'm wrong, where I'm thinking wrong, where I'm not doing something I should be doing. It can rebuke me. It can cause me to say, oh, no, I, I'm wrong there. But it goes further than that. It corrects. That means it sets something on the right path. So it doesn't just say you're wrong in this. It shows you how you can do it better. It corrects you, puts you in a correct place. And so there really aren't the same words, not the same concept. It's the idea of learning where we're wrong, but then learning how to do right. And that's part of what the Bible does. And as we, as we uh, do the observation phase of this, we can learn the difference between those Two words, it can give us a better insight about how God's word helps us. It says, for instruction in righteousness. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean, righteousness? And then we get to the, uh, it goes on down, it says, uh, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped. What does those words mean? Sometimes other translations can give us uh, more complete ideas, but what does the word complete mean? How does it apply in a spiritual way? These are things that we can consider as we are in the observation phase, pointing out certain words that we want to look more deeply into. What about the application phase here, the application phase? How can I allow God's word to teach me doctrine? 
Have I allowed God's word to reprove me lately? To correct me lately? Have I allowed God's word to direct me in righteousness? To change the way I live in some way? Maybe it's to deal with my temper problem. Or maybe it's some other issue that I have. How have I helped? How has God's word helped me to live more righteously? Things we can think about. And then go to God in prayer. Because obviously on something like this, we need God's help. Asking God, praying that he would help us to be changed by the scripture. To understand doctrine, to be reproved and corrected and instructed in righteousness. To ask God's involvement in our lives as we do that. Again, these, these are just examples of how we might do that. But it's, it's in this one case, it is the SOAP method. And it gives us a methodology, a process that we can go through to really guide us as we think about what we're studying. In the same way that a soap note, a medical soap note, would guide us when we're in the wilderness to know what we need to do first, what can we do second, what can we do next, and really delve into what we need to do. I printed out a, an example medical soap note, and it goes through all kinds of examples of what you might look for under certain circumstances as a prompt. To prompt you to check this, check that. In this way, in a similar way, uh, this type of study can help prompt us to study in perhaps a little different way, perhaps a way that may interest us and help us to glean something from the Bible. Again, there are many types of Bible study. And I hope that we're all encouraged to study the Bible on a regular basis. It's such an important part of our spiritual lives. But sometimes, to get out of perhaps a little lull that we're in, we need to try something different. Get excited about a different way of study. Soap is one of them. Uh, you may choose to try something else. But whether it's soap or not, we should be encouraged to regularly study the Bible and to also take the step of not only understanding it doctrinally for what it says, but applying it in our lives. It's so very important. We've all known people over the years who are tremendous Bible scholars, they just know so much. They can tell you where Scripture is and what it says. But their lives are messed up. They're just not applying it the way they should. That's, again, why I like this method so much. Because in our study, we ought to really be able to apply it in our lives. Understand it more deeply and apply it in our lives. So very important. So we'll conclude with that. I hope that in doing this, it helps you to utilize Scripture in a way that you do understand it more deeply, that it does help us change our lives. And as verse 17 says of 2 Timothy 3, it says that you may be more complete and that you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work.